Thank you for the introduction. So this is a short update on our work on Next 5000. So basically a summary on what we did in Lugano on Eurohack last year. So next slide, please. So I was sent down there and like the first talk in this use session, I didn't know anything about the open ACC part. So I was very happy to learn something new. So with me, I had Jing, uh, which has done most of this open ACC port from KTH side. And also Adam, which was also a complete new person for open ACC. So together with our great mentors, Andreas, from CSS and also Alan from NVIDIA. We managed to make great progress with this code. And this is a long-standing thing from KTH that we have been trying to get the classic NEC onto GPUs. It started back in, I think, 2014 in some European project. It has been dormant for some years, but now finally we are back in track. So next slide, please. So just a quick introduction to NEC. It is this old spectra element code from uh, mainly Argon. It even goes back to the 80s at MIT. So it solves uh, incompressible narrow strokes with a number of uh, physics that can be added. So it's on general hexadal spectral elements. So and it has a very special focus on single core efficiency. So everything is matrix free. It's built on tens of products. So you see in a picture to the left, there is basically the finite element mesh. And to the right, you see a very high order uh, element. So it's, you have a lot of points inside uh, each element. So it's Fortran 77. I think it's around 80,000 lines of code in the Fortran part of it. And then you have 10,000 additional code, uh, lines of code in the C part to do IO and communication. So it's, it's a nice uh, test case for opening to see to just incrementally add this pragma into the code and start to run it. So next, please. So just a, a uh, crash course in NEC. As I said, it's high order basis function, uh, which means that you cannot even, it's too expensive to just compute uh, the element matrices in the finite element setting. So these are expressed with a set of tensor products of the basis functions. And of course, if you cannot allow to assemble your element matrices, it's also too expensive to assemble the entire global matrix. But you will need a global matrix to ensure continuity between elements. So in the very simple mesh to the right, the, the red points are the ones that are shared between the different elements. So you have to make sure that we have continuity there. And also, um, of course, we want to set the boundary condition, for example, and that has to be done on the fully assembled system. Uh, and to do this in the matrix tree setting, we um, start to, to be very ignorant first and say that we can compute all these element matrices in parallel, which is super nice. And then we say that we can form a matrix AL, where we place all these element matrices on the diagonal. And then if we assume that we have two Boolean matrices on QT and Q, so if you multiply them left and right, that will actually then give you, if you have a very nice formed Q, will actually give you the full matrix A. Of course, we don't want to get the full matrix A, but you can easily drive on pen and paper that if you do Q, Q transpose, that would be, corresponds to a gather scatter kernel. So you gather all the red points together where you can sum them together, for example, and then scatter them, them back. So that is how this is done. You work on the local element and then you do a gather scatter to ensure continuity and apply boundary condition. So next, please. So next 5,000 GPUs, um, at the first uh, look, you think this is great, it's tensor product. And then you start to think, uh, how big are these? Well, they turn out they're uh, quite small. So the size of these element matrices relates to the polynomial order uh, and also the number of quadrature points, of course, which is around eight or 16. Uh, 16 would be nice. We never really go there because it uh, has some implications on the CFL number for our problems. So we try to keep them around eight or 10 for our production runs of KTH. Uh, so, the, so the matrices are small. And also, the, the code is written in a rather GPU unfriendly way. So, you typically have a loop over all the element, and then you issue a lot of these small matrix matrix products, one for each dimension, basically. So, it's very little work per call. So, it's not really GPU friendly. So, next, please. Uh, next slide. Yeah, sorry. Yes, good. 
So, and also the, the implication, if you look at, for example, now this is the SGM performance uh, for P100, but basically where NEC 5000 is, if you consider per element wise, you're basically down in the lower left corner, so you, you cannot really gain the good performance, so you basically have to do something else with this, uh, this matrix matrix multiplication. Starting off there, so next slide please. Uh, we never started with the full code, so in a typical NEC 5000 fashion, you always go for neck bone, which solves the Poisson equation using a precondition conjugate gradient solver. And it's even simpler than that because you, you assume the simplest preconditioner. So you basically are left with uh, the vector operations. And then in this listing here, you have on line 10, you have you see that you have this gather scatter, this Q, Q transpose. And then you have the matrix vector product to build your cryo sub subspace. So the gather scatter is referred to as GS in the following uh, schematics. And also then uh, uh, AX is this ALPL um, multiplication to give you to expand the crowd of space. So next, please. So moving up from the algorithmic formulation and into uh, a more block uh, structure here. So next one, it, it's a very simple code and it's easy to get your head around, even for me that haven't done OpenACC before. So it's basically you start with an initialization, you read some parameters, set up your grid and everything. And then you basically fire off 100 CG iterations and then measure uh, the performance. So basically the idea here was to use OpenACC in sort of, in our way, the, the easiest way possible. So use the directives to so have to get the data off the host as fast as possible. Uh, so, and also, of course, then we want to keep the entire problem on the device as long as possible. So next, please. But the problem is that we, we have some steps here where we actually need to keep it on the host. So, of course, in the initialization. And then this gather scatter is we have multi GPUs, for example. So, so the gather scatter have, of course, a local component. You have to gather scatter between all your local elements. And then if you have multi GPU, you also have to do the gather scatter between the different mesh partitions living on different devices. So here, of course, you have to then move the data back to the host, do the gather scatter over MPI, and then copy it back to the device. And also you have the inner products that, again, if you're running multi uh, device, you need to do the, the reductions uh, by moving data back and forth. So next, please. But uh, the good news is that uh, besides from that, there's a lot of uh, very GPU-friendly parts where we can do a lot of computations without moving data back and forth. So first, uh, we have, the, of course, the computation of AX to expand the crowd of space. So basically, we have this matrix uh, vector multiplication per element. So it referred to these small MXM calls that showed in the loop before. Uh, and then we have the local part of the gather scatter that can be done just by adding open ACC directives. Uh, of course, also applying boundary conditions we can do without moving data back and forth, the local part of the inner products. And then at the end, there are a lot of various vector operations like scale and add to, to build this uh, CG solver. So here it was very nice to see that compared to doing a queue after all these things was that we can easily just take for example, all the vector operations are in, in, a, in, a, in a file called math.f. So it was basically going through all these sprinkled with open ACC directives and everything worked out of the box as intended. Uh, so next, please. So something that, that needed some more work was this AX kernel. So remember what I showed in the beginning, we had this very short, we have this long loop with very small function calls uh, and it's, too little work to actually make any good use of uh, the GPU itself. So this was the initial work done back in, in Cresta in 2014 to figure out a way of expanding these things. So what they came up with was to merge all these small function calls into larger loops nest. So basically then you vectorize, you collapse all the top four loops, you vectorize over that, and you unfortunately will have a uh, small sequential loop in the middle for doing this matrix matrix multiplication to make the summation work. But overall, you have much more things to vectorize over. And um, so next, please, thank you. So here we see then that, uh, so the slides are a bit uh, strange, something happened in conversion, but anyway, it's readable. Uh, 
So uh, this is the result they came up with for my T100 back in the days. So they're running uh, neck bone. Uh, and it looks okay. You, you get uh, high flop counts uh, as expected. It gets better and better with more elements. It, it's a bit disturbing that it flats off. It doesn't really increase. But people are quite happy with this. Um, until um, someone actually tried it on a uh, Hashwell node in our Cray XC. So next, please. And there we see suddenly we have a quite bad performance. So the opening to see the base case here, the blue, is corresponds to sort of the production polynomial order as we usually run of KTH. And we see it's completely beaten by two uh, Intel Xeons. Uh, People were not so happy after, I think it was I who did this test, just to see how good the open ACC implementation were. But at least this was sort of the starting point when we went down uh, to uh, Lugano last year. So next please. So down in Lugano, the, the real focus was, the initial focus was that people thought that the port was very good. So uh, we were just focused on tuning the boundary conditions and solvers. But after this, after this, um, this benchmark, it was clear that uh, we need to do something about the tensor product. So we had some different ideas. Uh, we tried to use Cubas, for example, try different options, pack everything into a single matrix, do some banded things, and also strident, for example. But we never really got any good performance. Uh, and when we talked to the mentor, it was clear that we probably have two small matrices. So each of these uh, small matrices packed together uh, wasn't really ideal for uh, cube loss. So when we tried, for example, with high polynomial orders, it worked perfectly fine and was beating our open ACC implementation. But of course, that had other implications for, for the CFL uh, condition when we tried to solve the physics later on. So it's not really usable. So I think someone late at night down in Lugano came up that maybe we should actually have a look at the open ACC directives. So we talked to Jing, who um, said that, well, um, this was the thing that worked back in the days. It worked fine on the Cray compiler. I think we had an issue with the PGI, but uh, I don't remember. So after some very hectic discussion, also involving uh, mentors and some trial and error, we come up that actually the old formulation wasn't that good. So one, instead of collapsing all the, the topmost loop, we can move the sequential loop further up towards the top of it and collapse inside the loop instead. Uh, and this turned out to actually give us almost 40 times better performance. So next, please. So now this corresponds to the blue line with the triangles. So, so we are still uh, a bit behind the Hashwell results, the CPU results, but, but still it, it improves a lot. Uh, so unfortunately, here we sort of got stuck uh, with OpenSC. So I know it's an open ACC uh, presentation, but uh, someone mentioned the forbidden word at the, at the workshop that maybe we should actually try to use CUDA here. Uh, and not see CUDA, of course, to try it with uh, CUDA Fortran as well. So uh, next, please. So CUDA here is only done for this MXM, this very, very small kernel. And we can see it's a clear benefit then uh, to just do that compared to the triangles. Now we move up to the, the green uh, uh, dots here, for example. So now we are on par with the CPU performance. Uh, so next. So now we started to think that, okay, maybe this is a very good way forward. We have the bulk of the, of the application in OpenACC. We don't want to deal with a lot of small kernels. Uh, so instead we focus on tuning this MXM which in the end is sort of the key part of NEC. So here we started to do uh, a lot of work using uh, CUDA, uh, shared memory, everything in CUDA Fortran. So in the end, of course, we ended up with very specific kernels for specific polynomial orders, uh, but they turned out to work pretty well. Next, please. So finally, we started to see that we actually get somewhere. So now we're up at, uh, at the process there, the excess. So now we have uh, our past the CPU performance, and we're actually getting close to uh, the roof line if you actually do a, a me experimental roof line for the, for the kernel we are evaluating. Uh, and the reason um, why this is bad is actually we are using uh, shared memory here. So we're moving all the data into a three-dimensional block in shared memory, so it's much faster than generated code by OpenACC. 
So we had one more thing we do. So uh, the next slide, please. So as I briefly mentioned, we, we do have this in a 3D block. So basically we read in all the element data into a 3D block and then do everything in shared memory for the QDF Fortran kernel. With the implication that we are restricted to a maximum polynomial order that is dictated by the shared memory size. Uh, so we had we had a, a good PhD student recently in the group, and uh, he was reading a lot of papers, especially some papers from Seed, where they proposed to use uh, 2D slices, for example. So he spent some time uh, last spring after Eurohack to actually uh, try to implement the algorithms that they had. So we implemented a 2D slicing. It means that you will have more synchronization of the threads in uh, the K direction here in the figure, but in the end it, it should work out uh, faster. So next one, please. And yeah, it's, it improves it slightly. But um, in the end we see that we start to sort of hit the end of where we actually can improve this uh, even further. So we were quite happy with this. We had gained a lot of experience with Neckbone. So the next step will, of course, be to go from Neckbone to the full Neck 5000. So next, please. And this, again, shows the strength here as open as we have done uh, the design of how it should be done in Neckbone, a small code that we can handle. So then we can easily just incrementally add the OpenACC directives throughout the full code. We didn't have to port the entire uh, 80,000 lines directly. We could just do this incrementally. And also, given the experience of this uh, loop reordering tuning that we did in OpenACC, we could add this directly into Next 5000 instead of having to run very long uh, profile runs to actually see what we have to do this. Uh, to get a scatter kernel, I haven't talked about it a lot, but it actually is a very generic kernel in Neckbones. That was just a drop-in replacement. And it turns out that some of the kernels in Next 5000 are actually very similar to Neckbones. So it was basically, again, just uh, copy paste from Neckbone and then into Neck 5000 as well. So, so in the beginning, I said that Neck 5000 is uh, an incompressible solver. Uh, so it's, we solve the momentum equation, and we also need to solve uh, the pressure equation. So all the work we've done here is basically related to pressure. Uh, so we have uh, to momentum. So pressure we haven't really thought about here. So just looking at this optimized kernel here, so Axel to the right, that's the one that is similar to, to Neckbone. So now we actually do more work than before, but still the uh, rewarded ACC, it, it's sort of similar performance as the CUDA as well. So next one, please. So now just to show some final uh, results for the full code. So actually for the full code, we don't have any CUDA there as well, because we haven't had time to write these kernels uh, 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 so far. So now everything is open ACC. So this is on some recent Volta down at, I think it's uh, BSC and down in Spain. And you see that we get quite good performance for the high polynomial numbers compared to CPU results to the right. But for production runs, it's good. We are still faster, but we don't see that the very big benefit there. So something needs to be done. And that is sort of visible for the last case on the next slide. So here it's uh, a, a larger run we did uh, with the pipe simulations on pit stain. So now it's a bit difficult to see maybe, but so we should just follow the line. So somehow it has connected end points of the graph. So sorry for that, try to uh, look behind it. So we don't have perfect scaling for, for the uh, CPU. Um, so here we clearly see that the GPU code, it's much, much faster. So now we're comparing uh, nodes uh, with nodes. So a full CPU node with a full GPU node. You only have one P100 in each node of pit state. So for 128 uh, nodes, the GPU code is three times faster than the CPU. But what you can see here is that once you start to increase and add more nodes, it, we can clearly see that the GPU code doesn't scale. And the problem here is actually this gather scatter routine that I briefly mentioned in the beginning that you need to move so much data between uh, the host and the device, and it has been, to, be, to be done for basically every trial of iteration, so it has really shown to become a, a big bottleneck here as well. Which sort of leads me to uh, the summary. Next slide, please. So um, just to 
summarize also give the thought of uh, OpenSSC here. So we had some CUDA, uh, but overall OpenSSC was a perfect tool for us to incrementally port the entire application from CPU to GPU. Uh, although it, it was still necessary to spend some time tuning these kernels, um, uh, but here one really saw that it was important to have a, a representative mini app like Neckbone. So you can find the proper loop transformation in a small controlled environment and then just port them into uh, the full code. And then, okay, unfortunately, in the end, we had to cave and use uh, CUDA for some late, uh, very sensitive kernels. But overall, uh, having OpenAC for the bulk of 80,000 lines of old uh, Fortran code, that was uh, very nice. I was afraid that we had to port everything to CUDA when I went down to Lugano. So the final thing is this scalability issue that we saw at Pitstaint, and this is the current uh, thing that we are discussing uh, at KTH. So either we, we have to have very large polynomial order, which, again, is not feasible due to CFL uh, restrictions, or we need very, very large problems. But then again, we need to shuffle a lot of data between the device and the host, so we might have a bottleneck there as well. So what we have recently have been discussing is to move away from MPI to NVishMem so that we can initiate MPI from the device itself so we don't have to do the copying. Or given the OpenACC presentation this morning, um, I sorry, I didn't write in the chat, but for us, having the possibility to do a co-array put from the device would be immensely nice. We'd be very happy if that was possible. So this is something I would like actually to look at um, at your Act 20 starting soon. Uh, and of course, there we're also going to try to look more into this core script solver related to the pressure solver, which is also one of the bottlenecks where we don't scale at the moment. And I think that was the last slide. So uh, that's it for me. Thank you.